screening talk. Uh, maybe we can put uh, Professor Kim on screen and joining us from Seoul. And uh, let me have a introduce um, Professor Kim. And M Professor Michael Kim is from Yongsei, Yongsei University, and he received his PhD in Korean history from Harvard University's East Asia Language and Civilization Department. And his specialty is colonial Korean history, particularly in the pre culture, migration, wartime, wartime mobilization, and everyday life. And he has published over 30 articles, translations, and books, chapters on Korean history. And today, Professor Kim will give a short presentation on historical collective memories on Korean society, and particularly the um, histor historical period in the movie. And, and after the presentation, we'll have um, about 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A. So um, thank you, um, Professor Kim, joining us from Seoul. And maybe you can start your presentation. OK, um, I hope everyone can hear me OK. Um, before I begin, I would like to thank the Asia Society of Hong Kong for this opportunity to participate in this film screening. Uh, it's the first time I've done this via Zoom. so. I'll, I'll try my best under the circumstances. So um, uh, today I was asked to provide some historical context to the film uh, Ode to My Father, which in Korea is titled Kukje Shijang. So the film follows the life of a North Korean refugee, which Koreans call Shihyangmin, or those who have lost their hometowns. It's estimated that about 740,000 uh, North Koreans came south between 1945 when the division of the country took place in 1950. And then uh, another 600,000 came south during the Korean War between 1950 and 1953. And uh, many of these wartime refugees from the north then settled in the port cities like Incheon and Busan. And even today, you can find a high percentage of their descendants who are still living in these two cities. And so the title of the uh, movie in Korean refers to Kukje Chijang, which is an actual location that you can visit today in the city of Busan, where many of the North Koreans started their lives in the South because they had nowhere else to go to make a living. And the director of the film, uh, Yoon jae Gyun, explained to the media that he wanted to make a Korean version of Forrest Gump, if you guys have seen the movie Forrest Gump. So the movie features several famous episodes from modern Korean history, and also includes some um, cameo appearances by numerous famous historical figures. Now, many in the audience may not be aware, so let me explain some of them. They include Jung Ju Young, the founder of the Hyundai Corporation, who was the man getting a shoe shine from the boys at the start of the film. And then Andre Kim, the famous fashion designer who came into the shop and found inspiration from the stitches on Tuk Su's mother's sleeve. And Nam Jin, the, the popular singer who had actually volunteered to go to Vietnam. And he's depicted as the Marine who rescues Tuk Su from a Viet Cong attack. Uh, some of you may know that the role is actually played by the famous uh, K-pop star, Yun Ho from Dongbang Shingi, right? <laughs> so <laughs> that was him. So uh, I guess the best way to explain this movie is that it's about ordinary Koreans who live through extraordinary times and encounter many extraordinary people in their lifetime. And so uh, director Yoon jae Gyun also stated that his father and mother uh, was actually the inspiration for the, uh, or they were actually named after his real parents, uh, Tuk Su and Young Jung. And his father had passed away during his second year in college and he never had a chance to thank him, which is part of the meaning behind the last scene where the main character speaks to his father. So while there are many aspects of the film that I could elaborate further, I want to focus the rest of my uh, remarks on the historical events that were featured in the movie. So I think um, a lot of the people in the audience may wonder why the movie starts in the port of Hungnam, which is located on the east coast of North Korea. Well, Hungnam was actually the site of a major industrial complex built by the Japanese during the colonial period. Uh, it actually had the third largest fertilizer uh, company in the world. And some of you may know that Fertilizer can be, or nitrogen can be used for fertilizer, but also explosives. And so it's also part of the uh, munitions uh, industry in North Korea. So during the Korean War, the United Nations forces 
under U.S. command had, of course, stopped the North Korean invasion, but then decided to conquer the rest of Korea. And they reached all the way to the Chinese border on the Yalu River when the Chinese forces entered the conflict. And so the UN was then forced to retreat to Hungnam after the defeat at the Chosan Reservoir, but they feared that their escape route to the south would be blocked. And so this is why in December 1950, one of the most complex logistical operations in history took place as they evacuated the entire uh, UN army out of the port. And so the ship that appears in the movie was a real ship called the Meredith Victory, which famously evacuated 14,000 refugees. And so the passengers had to stand shoulder to shoulder and had almost no room to move throughout the entire voyage. And so a total of 86,000 refugees were actually transported out of the port, but that was only half the number of people that wanted to leave uh, during that period. So what's interesting here is that the father of the current president of Korea, Moon Jae-in, was actually one of the evacuees from Hungna. And this is probably why he, he watched the movie, despite the controversy that erupted over the movie for being too celebratory of the Korean past. President Park Geun-hye had actually praised the movie and many conservative Koreans wanted to promote the film. But President Moon at the time was quoted as saying that he didn't think the movie was made just for conservatives and that the nationalist sentiments portrayed in the movie was just a reflection of the times that all Koreans could identify with. So on, another major event depicted in the movie was the Korean miners and nurses who were dispatched to Germany. So you may also wonder why Koreans went all the way to Germany in the 1960s. Well, when the former president Park Jung-hee took over South Korea through a military coup in 1961, he wanted to launch Korea's first five-year economic development plan. But the United States did not approve of Park's military coup because he had overthrown a democratically elected government. So they didn't want to support his plan. That's why he had to turn to Germany for financial assistance. And so President Park uh, met the chancellor of Germany who was willing to offer a large loan of 150 million marks, but he was skeptical about how the Korean government could provide the necessary financial collateral for the loan. The solution that they came up with was quite unique. Germany at the time had a major shortage of miners and nurses because of its rapid economic growth. And so the Germans were willing to hire Koreans for these jobs with the condition that their wages would be deposited in a special savings account, which would then serve as a collateral for the loans. And so these accounts would belong to the workers, but they were forced to save a proportion of their savings every month. And so as a result, 8,000 South Korean miners were dispatched to West Germany and about 10,000 South Korean nurses uh, went to Germany as well. And so actually today, if you meet a Korean living in Germany, chances are uh, they can trace their origins to uh, this event and that their father is a minor and their mother is a, a nurse. And so I've actually met quite a few uh, Koreans in Germany with that background. Okay, and then another key uh, event in the movie, of course, was Korea's role in Vietnam War. And so to understand this, the Americans wanted more nations to participate in Vietnam as part of its More Flags program in 1964, but they couldn't find very many countries to participate. And so under the Brown Memorandum signed in 1966, South Korea sent over 300,000 soldiers to fight in the Vietnam War. In return, South Korea received about a billion dollars of US aid and individual Koreans who went to Vietnam were paid several times the average wage that they could receive in Korea. And so uh, Vietnam had actually led to over 30,000 casualties, including 5,000 deaths. But as the movie shows, it was also a financial opportunity for Korean men to earn money to take care of their families. And finally, uh, let me provide some details about the uh, extraordinary TV show that you saw at the end called Isan Gajogo Chasunida, or I Am Looking for My Lost Family. This was broadcast on the national TV station, KBS, from June 30 to November 14 in 1983. The show was actually part of a two-part episode to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the founding of the KBS TV station. And so the, it started with 150 people looking for their lost family members, and it was originally supposed to last just 90 minutes. But soon, over 1,000 people 
showed up at the station in hopes of finding their lost family. So they decided to extend the broadcast the next day, but Koreans kept on arriving from, from the entire country for a chance to find their lost relatives. And so KBS realized that something very special was happening. So they canceled all their scheduled programming and continued to broadcast nonstop for almost five months. And so during the 450 hours of broadcast, over 100,000 separated families had applied to be on the TV show and about 53,000 cases were aired, which led to over 10,000 uh, family reunions. So as you can see, it was quite an extraordinary broadcast that actually entered the Guinness Book of World Records in 1993 as the longest continuous live broadcast in history. 450 hours is pretty long, right? So as I mentioned at the start of my remarks, the uh, extraordinary events depicted in the mov movie involved countless numbers of ordinary people. And I think this is why the movie was able to capture a domestic audience of 13 million people uh, uh, in 19, uh, 2015, uh, and so I could go on, but I want to stop here so that I can have some time to answer some of your questions. Um, thank you, um, Professor Kim, for very interesting information. Um, lots of the information that you just talked about is the first time that I ever heard. Um, actually, I, I've prepared some of the questions and we will have the um, Q&A afterwards. So if you have questions, you can just raise your hand and our staff will um, give you the mic. Uh, maybe I could just start a couple of questions to um, Professor Kim. Um, actually, I, I just by the, um, the, the presentation you just talked about, um, the TV show, um, I'm just wondering, is the, is it, a lot of South Koreans still looking for their family in the North Korea now, or is it this kind of TV show or action still happening in South uh, Korea? There were a couple of other shows afterwards, but it wasn't quite so spectacular. Um, and of course, during the uh, 90s and 2000s, there were a number of family reunions that took place in the Kumgansan Resort between North and South Korea. And so uh, reunions uh, were in fact a major feature of North-South politics. But these days, there are only like, I think less than 10,000, 20,000 people that, you know, that have uh, separated families that are still alive who could remember, you know, that they were separated. So yes, uh, not anymore, but used to be a, a major issue. Um, actually, in the movies, it seems the foreign power or the foreign country plays a very important part, like the evacuation in the very beginning or the um, the Germany, um, the mining part, and then it goes to the Vietnam War. And even lots of um, non-Korean culture happens in the in the in the movie too so uh, how could you describe the influence of the foreign power or the foreign country to korean people uh, during that period of time okay so this would normally take an hour lecture but i'll, I'll do my <laughs> best <laughs> so there's no question that foreign powers will play a key role especially the united states of course and some critics have actually argued that the scene in the movie where the soldiers toss the candy at the children is actually a metaphor of the relationship between the foreign powers and Koreans, how Koreans are forced to fight each other because of this foreign influence. Um, at the same time, the part of the success story of South Korea is its willingness to engage with the international world. And so Korea's participation in Vietnam would lead to Korean companies getting certified as US military contractors. This then allows Korean companies to get lucrative Middle East contracts during the oil boom in 1980s. Uh, and of course, every aspect of Korean economic success involves exports to so many countries. So I think it's safe to say that many Koreans today consider themselves both the victims of foreign influence, but also the beneficiaries of foreign influence. So, you know, it has a very complicated history in Korea. So you mean the older generation or the younger oh, yeah. generation? Just in general, I think Koreans are very open to internationalization. In yeah. fact, one of the keywords, right? And so they've both suffered from the international influence, but they also a very strong awareness that they can benefit from it. Yes. I see. And um, actually, that's a very important part in the movie that when um, those so 
sorry, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't pronounce Absolutely. his name correctly, <laughs> that in the, uh, when he was in uh, Vietnam, that he said, um, he said something like uh, he would be happy if their children will not have to experience the same difficult difficulties that they are experiencing or they experienced. So this kind of saying that um, the self-sacrificing spirit in his generation is very important. It seems as that's a whole life goal to sacri sacrifice themselves for their family. Um, what do you think of that? Or maybe even well, for the young for the younger generation, do they feel the same way or do, do they understand that self-sacrifice? Okay, so actually, so in 2015, when this movie was a big hit, it was full of controversy. So what you just mentioned, that statement was actually uh, one of the most controversial statements. And one of the politicians actually said he wanted to throw up when he heard it, because he's so sick and tired of the older generation telling the younger generation we had suffered. At the same time, a lot of the older generation and, and many other Koreans were very much appreciative of the sacrifice. Um, and so uh, it, it absolutely reflects the sense among the older generation that they had given up so much for the past. Uh, but it's also part of the political divisions of South Korea that there's maybe uh, among the younger Koreans a kind of a, uh, a, a, they're kind of tired of hearing this all the time, right? At the same time, the, 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 the older generation truly did sacrifice. And, and so they, they're never going to let you forget it. <laughs> and so this is, again, part of what makes South Korean politics so dynamic today. So, uh, yeah, I, I read lots, lots of articles about the movie when I was uh, researching um, for the questions there. There's a lot of um, pro and anti this movie. Yes, but yes. Um, actually, it's quite interesting to understand the that generation of Korea because the the K-pop culture is so popular mm -hmm. now, but for me or the generation or maybe people in Hong Kong or ev everywhere, we just know what's happening in Korea now, but not necessarily about the past. So I think but this I, movie you, give a very good introduction on the Korean. Yeah, and and your question about the younger generation. Well, you know, um, history is actually not a required class in Korean high schools. Unless yes, sir, you're you mean the, the Korean, Korean history? Yeah, it's not a required course. Although if you want to take the Korean SATs, you have to study it. But only like half the college students are selected by uh, Korean SATs these days. And so uh, a lot of Korean, younger Koreans never have history in high school. Uh, therefore, a lot of them are not very familiar. Like they'll know about the Korean War, but they probably wouldn't know about the Hungnam uh, evacuation, right? Um, and so, and they probably know about separated families, but they won't know about the KBS uh, TV show, right? So uh, I think the movie actually kind of refers to this when at the very end, uh, the, the granddaughter is singing that song, Kutsera Kumsuni, which was a very famous song, 1953 by Hyunin. Uh, you know, everyone in the family is like, oh, why you teach that girl that song, you know? But <laughs> it's, it's so old, you know, teach her something more, you know, contemporary, but, uh, that's kind of the way I think the older generation sees it. And uh, this interaction between Koreans thinking that the old past is past, and then a lot of Koreans who still want uh, Koreans to remember the past uh, is part of the, again, part of the dynamics of Korean uh, politics today. That's, that's very interesting. The first time that I ever heard uh, a country or that they don't require the students to learn about the history. Well, you learn it in but elementary school, but you don't subject. learn it in high school. Yeah. Yeah. So it's um that's something very interesting to know. So uh, for the audience, if you have any question, you can just raise your hand anytime, and then uh, we'll pass you the mic. And yes, sir. Uh, maybe we have um at the front row. Uh, we have a gentleman for the question. Yes, actually, my question uh, may have been answered already in a roundabout way, but I just wanted to confirm. So there's a very short scene with, I think, an Indian Korean couple uh, who claim to be from Busan and some local uh, Koreans uh, in whichever city it is sort of picking on them and, and, and being very rude to them and disrespectful. And um, it struck me that perhaps those uh, kids didn't realize the history of how the UN forces, including Indian forces, um, assisted 
the south and uh you know the massive uh war graves or, or commemor commemor commemorative graves at busan which i've been to uh sort of make it clear that the korean people were officially very grateful to every single nation that contributed to um you know, to restoring the South, basically, to, to restoring the Republic of Korea. So could you could you comment on that? Is, is that basically due to the ignorance of, of those sort of high school kids portrayed in, in the movie in that short snippet? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's part of the intention of that scene is sort of point out that uh, Koreans don't know about the past, younger Koreans. And of course, it's really about how the main character, he himself was kind of like a migrant laborer, right, from the north to the south. And so when he sees another migrant laborer being abused, he, he of course, gets really upset. But uh, I think a lot of the older Koreans who remember being, you know, refugees and, and migrant labor would, would totally understand that scene. But many of the younger Koreans, uh, they would not understand, right? And as you, as you pointed out, and it, there's actually a, a graveyard near Busan, where the United Nations forces are buried. And so you would think that the local you know, people in Busan would, would be aware of it. And I think the older Koreans are, but many of the younger ones are not. Thank you. And we have another question. Uh, could you say something about um, um, how the national anthem was presented? There were two scenes where, of course, everyone stood up to sing the anthem, but it, it was kind of um, sarcastically portrayed that people would fallen into that. Okay, well, that seems also another part of the controversy because uh, President Park Geun-hye actually had, who was president, the daughter of Park Jung-hye becomes the president. And then she pointed out that, oh, look at the scene where, uh, you know, the, the couple was fighting, but then when the uh, national anthem is played, they stop fighting. She, she was like, that's perfect. That's exactly what you should do. Now, <laughs> the movie itself may have been kind of played, uh, like parodying it, but the president actually took it very seriously. <laughs> and so uh, I think it kind of shows you the divide in, in, in Korea, right? Among those who look at those scenes and feel a, a lot of pride in it. And then those who would look at it maybe a little bit more uh, as, as more of a parody, right? And now we have one question. Yeah. Hi, hello, Professor. Uh, I have two questions, actually. Uh, the first one actually concerns the concept of Han. Um, I, I did East Asian studies as an undergrad back 15 years ago, and I recall that when I learned about Korean culture and history at that time, we discussed the concept of Han, i.e. the uh, melancholy caused by the um, pretty turbulent uh, modern Korean past, many of the episodes which were actually visualized in this movie. Um, now that 15 years 15 years has, have passed already since I took that course. Do you think that this kind of sentiment, this Han sentiment, has totally become a thing of the past? Now that a career has sprung in international stature, BTS, K-pop getting uh, popular all over the world. So that's my first question. My second question concerns the use of uh, history, historical themes in popular culture in Korea. I have always been impressed by the constant use, actually very frequent usage of these historical themes, including the turbulent modern past in many of the movies and dramas. And as you know already, Professor, uh, there is also a constant stream of controversy surrounding these um, movie and drama works. And one, well, while the accusations or the controversies can be different in nature, the usual theme of such a controversy is that history may not be portrayed accurately or history may be distorted or in Korean, so my question would be, and the underlying thinking is that movie makers or drama makers should in a way stick or be faithful to um, an accurate portrayal of history. That sounds like the, um, the underlying thinking of when they make uh, criticisms of such movies. And my question would be, um, what do you think? Do you think that there's really this ethical responsibility on the part of movie makers or drama makers that they should be faithful or to be truthful to what really happened in the past when they make such um, when they make such um, movies or dramas? And if yes, how should the line be drawn between um, 
the past which we have to be faithful or to be truthful to the past and past which we can apply creativity, such as a dramatization or like a fictionalization. Or should we do it an easier way to take the other approach, which is to educate the audience that, hey, movies uh, movies, they can try to make it as accurate or um, as, as close to what really happened in the past, but after all, they are just movies and there will be fictionalized past. Should we just instead try to educate the audience that movies do not equate to history? Thank you. <laughs> Well, wow, uh, it would take me another hour to respond to that <laughs> one, but let me try again <laughs> very quickly. Um, well, you, you mentioned Han. Well, you know, uh, I have an entire lecture where I explained that the concept of Han is actually a, a colonial product. In traditional Korea, don't, there's no mention of Han, but the Japanese folklorists uh, uh, in the 1920s had invented that concept. But then after 1945, it becomes very real that Koreans are all believed themselves to have been victims and sorrow. And, and Han is very much a real concept after division and Korean War, right? But and so as you, as you point out, now that Korea is so successful in many of the cultural and economic realms, are the younger generations kind of losing the sense of Han? Actually, I think you a lot of uh, observers kind of think that's going on, that a sense of um, of loss. Uh, actually, you can look at the example of Ireland. Once the, the Irish uh, GDP went higher than the British, they no longer got mad at the British so much. And so I think the same thing will happen when Korean GDP becomes higher than Japan, then the entire concept of Han may actually kind of erode, right? So again, that's just kind of, I'm half joking about this, but that's, that I think a, a number of people might uh, view it that way. But your, the other question about uh, realism or like what, what actually happened in history versus um, what, how people interpret history, this is uh, what historians struggle with all the time. Like what is the real past and, and, and can movies actually depict it? Uh, my answer is that I, I tend not to watch these historical films because I know that they have so many problems with them. So it just makes me so upset to see, you know, uh, the history of movies. Um, but they are very much a thing. And as you pointed out, the Korean history has so much rich material for movies and dramas. And um, yeah, so what had been such, uh, you know, a uh, history of all this like, um, um, devastation and violence and, and so on now becomes the backdrop for so much of the K-pop and not K-pop, the K-dramas and movies and so on, right? And so, but I, I do think that there is a ethical responsibility of the filmmakers as well as academics involved if they're consulted uh, to make sure that some of the humanistic kinds of principles are maintained, like like the whole comfort women issue and, and, and others that, that are so controversial. like. Oftentimes, some of the basic human rights issues get kind of overlooked. And like, this is part of the problem of this movie, actually, and the controversy that, yeah, 1970s, 80s was a period of economic uh, growth and success, but there was also this darker side of, you know, suppression. And there was a massacre in 1980s where th over a thousand Koreans were killed. So um, there's this darker side, right? And, and so I think movies should be careful not to, they, they do need to have more balance and that's part of the controversy of this film, yeah. Right, yeah, that's a um, very good, very good questions and, and, and great answer. And actually I have a last question because, um, okay, maybe we can talk, uh, step away from the history, we could uh, go back to the family theme because um, our entire film series is about the uh, Korean families in films. In the very beginning, that um, the, the whole family is taking a family trip to Thailand without the grandparents and the kids. Mm -hmm. And they, um, he asked a very good question is, um, are we a family? Because they are ex pretty excluded. So do you think the uh, probably maybe the younger generation um, ideas are, on family is very different from the older generation, you, you say? Yeah, well, you know, the... Uh, um... The director of this film was interviewed several times and every time he says that he didn't want to make a political movie he wanted to make a family movie and so i think the reason why he opened the movie that way he's, he's trying to kind of suggest that 
some family values had been lost and that there is a need to respect and you know, do more family kinds of things together that maybe in the contemporary uh, South Korea, uh, some of the family values are not as strong as they had been in the past. So uh, I, I, I do think that we should look at this as a family drama, as a family movie. And, you know, the, his, history is very fascinating and it, it provides a great backdrop, but it really is about a family, right? And, and so uh, I think, and that's actually why I think that this film, despite all the controversy, did get a Moon Jae-in and, and all these different conservatives all to watch the film together because it, it is ultimately a film about Korean families. Thank you. That's a very good comment on the family part of this family. So um, this is the end of our program. Thank you for coming um, today. And thank you, um, uh, Yong, Yong Sun Wong Foundation for supporting the film series. And thank you, uh, Professor Kim, joining us from so taking your time. Thank you very much. Um, our next screening uh, for this um, film series is a brand new life. Uh, it was scheduled. It, it is scheduled on September twenty fifth. Uh, it's a Saturday. So, and the post screening topic is about overseas adoption um, in Korea and also the family family uh, family value in um, Korea as well. So, if you're interested, you can go to our website for registration. Thank you for coming today, and thank you, Professor Kim. Thank you. So, hopefully, we we'll see you again. Thank you. Mm -hmm.